think for me, um, the arts at their best challenge people's preconceptions and constructs around certitudes. Art can be an aesthetic object that can be commodified, that can be sold. Um, there's a huge market for contemporary art. But for me, I'm, I'm not interested in that. I think years ago I made that decision. Music is my thing. You know, every morning I get up and listen to music with the radio in the background. I put my headphones on. Sometimes start the day. I started this morning with Aretha Franklin. Art is, is, is uh, I mean, it's, just, it's trying to put a value judgment on something that you do. So it's a very difficult thing to, 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 to be explicit about. But for me, it's about, you know, when you create something, a film or a visual art, in my case, um, it's about an emotional response. I think that's one of the great things that theatre can do. Theatre can bring people together that have never met each other before to experiencing something live that tells them something, that tells them a new narrative, that makes them think that the world, or makes them look at the world differently. Of course, art goes right across the board when you think about it. Uh, and I don't know how to defend it. It's, it's like the question, you know, uh, the meaning of life, I think. But I suppose what I could say about it is, is that it, 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 it is, to me, sort of a reflection of life, but in all its aspects. That out of something so ugly and horrendous of, of the events that had happened, that people are coming out the other end and then can express it through the creative arts and can express it in a different way. I feel that there's almost a hunger there. Uh, in in people for the articulation of something bigger than ourselves. Well, I think history has shown that art is a very effective way of dealing with this topic. And um, it can sometimes be more powerful than actual war or um, even politicians or anything like that. This is a major retrospective, um, a group show, if you like, of some of the work of our finest um, artists and indeed some internationally acclaimed artists. We've got, um, you know, um, Turner Prize um, nominees here um, represented in this show. So it is an opportunity, I think, which hasn't been there for a very, very long time and arguably should have been there before now, for local people to come and see how our artists during the decade of the three, well, the three most turbulent decades of our political history, recent history, saw the troubles and its impact um, on themselves and their work as artists and on the wider society. Indeed, you will see some of the, the there are many different themes, there are many different meanings, there are very many different interpretations built up layer upon layer. So there's something in this exhibition, I think, that warrants being seen, needs to be seen. Uh, I think people will appreciate um, the fact that it gives them a new sense of the complexity of what it is we have all lived through um, from various standpoints. And that's so important as a contribution, I think, to understanding what it is we did in fact come through.
Well, photography in terms of visual arts is perhaps one of the most democratic art forms. So it has a unique ability to engage people. And we're very interested here in gallery photography in looking at how that can um, work in a political way. So I think that um, there are a number of issues, like a lot of the issues that, that Aftermath raises, which people are familiar with and maybe a little jaded about. And, kind of don't engage with as readily as maybe people who live along the border or in Northern Ireland. So we were very, very keen to cite this exhibition here in one of the leading cultural venues in Dublin. We're delighted that Dr Luke Gibbons from NUI Minute is going to launch the exhibition because again, someone of Luke's stature will bring a whole other audience and, and attention to this project, which, which it merits. And, and I think post-conflict, it's really important that these issues continue to be addressed and that's why we were interested in showing this work here in Dublin. What you see on the, on the walls around you are people who are um, living today, obviously, in County Louth, maybe someone in South Armagh, elsewhere, they're real people, and they have a story to tell. And um, in terms of putting the exhibition together, I think the, what is uh, been really significant about this is you're not looking at uh, sort of snapshots here, these are photojournalism, I mean they're, they're photographs that were captured with people after a long process of engaging with them. Uh, it's been a two-year project and the exhibition is a, the final outcome of that there. When we see photographs like these, we feel impelled to look at the stories behind the pictures. But I think it was Walter Benjamin once said that such are the pressures of the past that sometimes history can only be told through images. And one of the most moving aspects of the exhibition here is in the pieces to camera at certain points um, people are telling their story and they seem to be adjusting to what has happened and then suddenly some flash of memory comes up from the past and the story stops and the camera just leaves their face and indeed you could argue that the photographs are picking up from that spot that the photographs are picking up where narrative leaves off so in that sense the photographs are about what's unspoken but cannot be said and that is the gap between what happened and the representation of what happened. And that gap can often take decades, not just years, to unfold. And it had an impact on the North, and, and we all accept that. But I actually think that the Northern Ireland conflict had a, a profound impact on us in the South. And for me, what happened, and it, it affects us still to this day, is that we never grew up. I was co the commissioned artist for the Aftermath project. Um, you know, very early on, I realised that this would be a collaborative project insofar as, um, you know, the key components of Aftermath are photographs, film, interviews, and uh, an orchestral music score. And for me, that's always exciting to work collaboratively. It, the, you know, the project becomes the sum of its parts. But my role was to consider, first of all, the participants we worked with. And in a very, you know, relatively short space of time, we worked with more than 90 people, which is really phenomenal. And what those people represent is a particular historical moment for me. In 1968, 1969, as the Troubles began in the North, People, particularly in Belfast, were burnt out of their homes and they were forced to migrate across the border to places like County Louth, County Monaghan, 
where they subsequently settled, and now you have you know second generation of, of, of those people, but they've been largely forgotten. So for me, aftermath was also retracing that history. And one of the key things we decided to do was to do archival research to find those early photographs that depict those moments of crisis, if you like, when people were forced out of their homes. And you know, the Irish Times did a particularly good job, journalistically. And um, photographically, they, you know, they represented that time. It was a way of capturing and contextualizing that history. It gave us a, a foundation, I thought, to enable us to really understand, you know, um, what those people were, you know, what they left and, you know, what they were dealing with now. Um, the strategy photographically then was really quite straightforward, I think. I mean, we had, you know, a limited amount of time. We wanted to be... Um, create, if you like, a situation where people, people were all equal as a democracy, perhaps, in uh, the way that we photographed. So the photographs were all taken with a daylight studio, which is simply just a, a neutral grey backdrop carried into people's homes, sometimes photographed in their kitchen or garden or somewhere else. But the key thing is you're isolating people from their immediate background. So there's no kind of indicators about, you know, um, social standing, so everybody's equal in that sense. It's the way that um, people decide to uh, present themselves, the way they dress, the way they hold themselves. So there's a representation of, of, of those individuals. That on its own is one aspect, but I think what's also important is to create some kind of geographical context. So drawing on a, my own photographic archive and new photographs I've made during Aftermath, um, started to look at how the landscape looks now on the border and how that landscape is still in transition. So places like the Fork Hill helicopter base, um, other military installations, other traces that still exist within the landscape that point towards that kind of um, violent past, but also in a way project towards the future. So the two elements of aftermath for me was a series of portraits and then taking these landscapes and juxtaposing them with with those portraits you create potential meaning so it's not fixed it's not definite but when the viewer encounters those photographs it opens out the possible uh, readings or the possible kind of interpretation that the viewer might have you know from the period of like mid late 90s i've been photographing in these areas and i think i've been building slowly an archive uh, of how the landscape has particularly been changed. And uh, Fork Hill is a small village not far from here. It's a good example. At one time, it was the busiest helicopter base in Europe. And, um, you know, in a way, it's in, it's in a privileged position, a vantage point within the centre of the village. You can survey the mountainside and all the key areas all around. It's very interesting to go in there when the British Army finally abandon that space because um, as you walk around and you see this kind of steel fencing and you can see you can see the mountains just peering over the top but you do you do get this you get the sense of this kind of really temporary space except that it it actually survived in the village for more than 20 years and I think what's interesting for me is like how those spaces can be used afterwards and you know standing standing in the helicopter base the former helicopter base in Fork Hill it's really interesting now that you start to see social housing being built and it, you know it's been returned to a normal um, societal function which is you know which is great progress i think so also connected to aftermath i think what was key and it was one of the objectives of the, of the project was also to consider um, people who had arrived in Ireland during the economic boom, during the so-called Celtic Tiger years. So this is another interest of mine around uh, displaced people internationally. What's generally recognised is that those people are often coming from very similar um, conflict situations or you know, highly charged political situations where people are forced to leave their homes very quickly and arrive in a safe space. So I think for the Aftermath project to include that international uh, dimension is really important. Not, not just because um, in itself, I think when you then you know, create a wide context around both the um, displaced people from the north and this international context, I think it, um, you know, it creates a deeper meaning.
Last year I received a commission through the Piece of Art uh, based in, in County Louth project and the idea is that it would come under the, the larger umbrella project of, of Aftermath and the idea is that um, I would work with a group of people um, based mainly around the County Louth area and that I would engage with them and that we would collectively create a, a piece of music. The people that, that were involved in the project were people who have been involved in conflict or if, who have come out the other end of it or who have been displaced and for whatever reason have ended up around the County Louth area. And, uh, and, and obviously as well in terms of age, the group involved working with the young children and older people and people from all arts and parts of the world with different accents, different, I suppose, um, proficiencies in, in, in English. And uh, so talking to Lawrence about it and kind of starting, first of all, with an empty sheet and kind of working, you know, how, how do we do something like this? Uh, so we come up with the idea of, of using some professional musicians. Um, so we decided to work with a cello and violin, two stringed instruments. And I suppose the reason for using instruments like that is that they're very soft and that they can blend very well with the human voice. And then the idea is that then the groups that I worked with, that we would record their voices. Now, usually when you think of music, the voice would normally be a sung voice, whether it's a song or some kind of a like opera, that kind of thing. So it's very different then when you work with the spoken voice because you don't have that... Uh, you know, pitch and rhythm and dynamics and all those kind of musical things. But then what you do get when you work with the spoken voices, you get amazing, I suppose, qualities of timbre and accents. And because of, of the, I suppose, the range of people, not only in the range of where they're from, but their age and uh, where they're all at in their lives and the experiences that they've come through, really affects, I think, the timbre and the colour of their voice. So I think that was something for me that was quite a challenge in that I wasn't working with, everybody as professional musicians who could all read and write music, but my role was really to engage with them in a really safe but fun way. I want to tell you. What? I want to tell you. Two. I tell you. I want to tell you. I want to tell you. I want you. I want you. I want to tell 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 you. April, May of last year, um, two of the groups came together at different times and did a residency. So I was part of that. So I came down with a little recording device and Lawrence came up with the idea of this question, um, I want to tell you, and what is it that they wanted to, to tell me? So, and what was really interesting is that I remember the very first session was a little boy and he, we decided to start at one side of the circle and go round. So the people who were sitting at the far end of the circle were delighted because they knew they were going to be last. And I remember this little boy leaning forward to my microphone and saying, I want to tell you that my favourite colour is orange. And you could just feel the whole group going, oh, isn't that lovely? I see, you know, that we can just say something about how we feel, that it doesn't have to be very specific or it doesn't have to be, you know, that related to the theme of, of dealing with conflict and all of that. And I think when you work with the creative arts, uh, if you say something and you say it with truth and you really mean it, regardless of what it is that you say, um, it really then carry, carries itself. So I think if you make people feel comfortable and that they're there because they, they want to be there and that they've got something to share with you, whether it's that little boy saying, I want to tell you my favourite colour is orange, or another lady saying, you know, I recently turned 60, I'm now the age my father was when he was killed. You know, in these incredibly poignant moments. Editing it down to about maybe a 10 minute track, and then once I got that set, it kind of naturally fell into maybe five or six different sections, different kind of theme text sections. And then sitting here at the piano, then I composed then the part that the violin and the cello. And then when it came to the premiere back in the spirit store in September of last year, um, all the people who were involved we're all in the audience, listening to their voices coming back through the speakers. And then Zoe and Alva, our cellist and violin, then playing live along with it. I want to tell you. 
I want to tell you. From sorrow to happiness, I have a smile. You can be what you want to be. About my life. The concert is entitled Songs of War and Peace and it's going to take place here at the jail in Dundalk and um, so it's very apt and it really fits in with the theme of the music. I suppose the pieces um, involved in the piece um, are showing maybe the horrors of war and also um, you know the opposite of that so they're trying to show that um, you know that there is peace there, that there is hope there um, so there's, there's always that underlying kind of darkness um, throughout the pieces, but then there is also the hope on the other side. I think history has shown that art is a very effective way of dealing with this topic, and um, it can sometimes be more powerful than actual war or um, even politicians or anything like that. And um, I suppose the composers are, are, are using that as a tool, as a kind of a, a neutral ground for people to be able to express um, their, their real feelings. I want to tell you. I want to tell you. I want to tell you. My name is Margaret. Um, my mum's name is Margaret, and she was always called Peggy. Just a few weeks ago, I was in, in Belfast in the Ulster Hall at um, the exhibition Art of the Troubles, and uh, I was deeply moved by, by so much of the art there, and uh, I think that's an example of uh, of art speaking to not only the past and a very painful past, but um, offering a way towards towards a future, uh, towards living in the present and coming to terms with the past in the present, uh, and and shaping a, a truly better future. But the the value of art in society, you know, if you look at um, the reaction to Seamus Heaney's death, but also his life and his poetry, I think you see uh, how deeply attached we are to uh, the best of what art can say for us and uh, can, can bring us. Uh, I, I've recently, thinking about Heaney, I've recently gone back and looked at the work of Yeats, thinking about all the anniversaries we're facing into. And if you take a wonderful late poem like Kukul and Comforted, that again seems to me to go to the heart of uh, this issue of, of uh, art and peacemaking and conflict where, you know, Cucullin sews his shroud and um, surrounded by people, outcasts, people who have betrayed others. Um, and through the, the common toil, uh, there's the transformation. Uh, uh, and what's the line? Something like, um, uh, they change their throats and become the throats of birds. A man that had six mortal wounds, a man violent and famous, strode among the dead. Eyes stared out of the branches and were gone. Then certain shrouds that muttered head to head came and were gone. He leant upon a tree, as though to meditate on wounds and blood. We're a theatre company that does site-specific theatre, which means that we do theatre in non-theatre spaces. So we've done theatres in taxis, synagogues, churches, on the street, in shops, various places. Communal experiences are kind of few and far between. We get it mostly with sport. I think that's one of the great things that theatre can do. Theatre can bring people together that have never met each other before to experiencing something live that tells them something 
that tells them a new narrative, that makes them think that the world, or makes them look at the world differently, that inspires them, moves them, makes them hopefully think differently. And I suppose politics with a small p and a big p is within all of our work. Uh, we have done various projects. Uh, for example, some of our larger projects, we spent two years archiving the story of the Jewish community in the north of Ireland. And uh, we archived that and we gave it back to the community. And we also gave it to a playwright. And we commissioned a play called This Is What We Sang that we staged in a synagogue in Belfast that looked at the story of the Jewish community in the north really over the last 40 years. They told the story of a community that maybe a lot of people didn't know about. But through them, we looked at the conflict. We looked at the Blitz, we looked at the evolution of the city. And then also we've done projects that would be more specifically political, I suppose. Uh, we uh, have staged a show in a black taxi, which travelled from the Falls Road, uh, or travelled from the bottom of the Falls, up the Falls Road, through the Peace Line in Northumberland Street and down the Shankill, and it was called Two Roads West by Lawrence McKeown. And what was interesting about that piece was, we were asked to do a piece that would connect those that lived in the outskirts of Belfast with, with kind of the inner city area. And I suppose one of the... the residues of conflict is the fact that very few people cross Belfast. All our, all our transport systems means you, you come into the city and then you go out of the city. So they wanted to find a project that would connect people. And we used the city of Belfast as a backdrop. We treated the audience as tourists and it was five audience each time. And the taxi driver was an actor and uh, he was playing a character originally from the Shankill who had been away for various reasons. Um, he had lived in London for a long time, had come back and wanted to tell his version of the changing face of Belfast and present that to the visitors. And I suppose that's a big thing when it comes to uh, post-conflict, I'm very interested in how we present the narratives of our city to those that are coming to see our city. So that we present it warts and all, but also frame it within a fiction, fictional and a factual manner. Um, and the other character in that play was a woman in the back of the taxi who had left Belfast pre-conflict in 1965, 66. And uh, she was coming back to look at the city again. And she was looking at it with fresh eyes. So it was how the, it's to help people um, like re-look at their surroundings, kind of imagine new possibilities for their city. And then out of that, we developed a project called um, Those You Pass in the Street, uh, again by Lawrence McKeown. And it uh, is a piece primarily looking at dealing with the past. And uh, it's a drama about 55 minutes in length each time we do it. We do it with a post-show discussion so that the themes within the play can be discussed further and people get a chance to air their concerns, air their prejudices, to discuss what they would like to happen as regards the future of Belfast and the future of the North of Ireland. Are they round here often? I ask them to help. You ask them to help? They're the elected representatives here. Well, that's a reflection on the people here. My God, Lizzie, you could have gone to somebody else. Like? There are others who could actually get it sorted. Think of the laugh they'll have. They kill your husband and then you go to them cap in hand. I didn't go cap in hand, Anne. I asked them to deal with a problem. Yeah, and that's how they get their votes, on the ground, making themselves available. Is that not what they're supposed to do? Or what we elect them for? Are you saying you voted for them? No, I didn't vote for them. I didn't vote for anyone. I just don't understand. Because I've not had a good night's sleep in ages. And if they can sort it, that's fine with me. You really think that's an end of it? They'll have it in the papers. Widow of murdered RUC man goes to Sinn Féin for help. They'll be looking at a photograph with you. They'll probably bring Jerry Adams up specially for it. Then they'll be right looking your vote or better still using you out canvassing. I think that's taking things a bit far, Anne. You just wait. We have had some of the most incredible, informed, emotive uh, discussions with people that feel passionately that there must be a way of us creating a healthy society post-conflict. That doesn't forget the past, but can come to terms with it.
and uh, to give them a framework by which they can discuss what they would like to see as the future for their children and the future for the community that they grew up in. What I'm interested in for many, in many ways is the emotional journey that people went through in the conflict here. Uh, so that's not fact-based necessarily, that's testimony-based, that's, that's people's own personal story. And it's not really thinking too much about uh, you know, uh, the archive and thinking about what is the record of this place. For me, I'm actually very much more interested in the transition and uh, for people to try and move forward and for people to try and create conversations, create a space for them to be acknowledged, for example, and for them to be heard. So Theatre Witness is a form of theatre that uh, deals with uh, those who would be marginalised in society, those who ordinarily wouldn't be in the mainstream media or certainly in the mainstream arts who would have a, an opportunity to, to voice their story. So it tends to be people who come from, who represent uh, themselves firstly, but often communities that uh, we don't often hear from, such as the uh, security forces, such as prisoners, such as ex-prisoners, former combatants. Um, they're brought together uh, to create a theatre group and you know usually about five or six in the group and they stand up on stage with no experience usually um, previous experience and tell their own story and I would say again that's their emotional story of their uh, you know life and in the main they tend to be related to the conflict here there have been the last few projects uh, in their own words for the large part uh, which is condensed version of their life. It's 10 minutes on stage. Um, often they've gone through an awful lot. Many of them suffer from post-traumatic stress. Um, and then that emotional journey is, is the, the journey that the audience goes on also, which is very difficult. Um, but even more so, I think, to try and capture on, on film, because effectively that is a process. The most important part of it all really is the process. Uh, what happens behind the scenes, I think the product or the performances are are a bonus for people to come and see um, but I think the greatest part of it all happens between the group the dynamic inside these the groups which create safe spaces and safe spaces are, are the key here I think. This is intergenerational there's a sense that even though it's not a secret where you know the story there's a sense that there's all this unknown and people have been carrying the um, almost the emotional secrets in their blood since the day they were born. Kieran's role in this is really kind of twofold. In one way, he is a silent witness. Um, he's every man who has, for whatever reason, felt unable to speak and just watched and absorbed. And that feels like a very central um, story in Northern Ireland that I've heard so much with people saying that they can't speak. We Carried Your Secrets and Release are the two films that I, I made with uh, the Theatre Witness project. Um, they bo Both of those films function in different ways. The early film, We Carried Your Secrets, was the first project here in Northern Ireland and it largely documents the process of what happened here. Um, and that um, has been very successful from the point of view of the project. It has gone internationally, worldwide. Many, many groups have seen it. Uh, mostly groups that are interested in peace activism, uh, social justice, um, that dynamic of transitioning out of conflict. Um, so that film really worked hand in hand with uh, Taya Sepinok, the artistic director for the theatre pro project, uh, to try and um, document what she was doing and how she did what she was doing, and also then the impact that it had on the journey, if you like, for the, the, the six people that were involved in that project. You know, ways of expression can't uh, is represent the unrepresentable. And that is, you know, it's a big challenge to all of us who are trying to deal with the conflict here, for example, and trying to find ways that tell the stories of the conflict. You know, for example, in the film We Carried Your Secrets, Robin Young, uh, who is a police officer uh, who was involved with the Oma bomb, talks about picking up body parts. But on film and in visual sense, how do you represent that? There's a real danger that you could re-traumatise Robin uh, or many other people that survived that or indeed were very badly affected by it.
At the time of the blast, there had been seven soldiers in the armoured personnel carrier. I didn't want to look at what remained. I opened the bag. Nothing. Not one shred of anything. The force of the blast had sucked seven human beings out through the viewing windows, each one of them the size of a mail slot. Totally vaporised everything. Given that we're, you know, particularly in this building, we're in a school, it has a long history. Um, but you can see the influence of arts in the school, and you can see heart nourishes the the pupils, and because it's about their expression and the absolute freedom to express themselves, it's just written large all over the place. One of the best examples of it recently has been the role of the Ulster Orchestra. Again, I mean, they're in Derry City as part of city culture. They're in the Bog side, the Craigan, um, and in my own city of Belfast. They've been on the Shankill. They've been in Twinbrook with kids who never seen the Ulster Orchestra before. Um, what the Ulster Orchestra have done is they've given those kids nourishment. They've given them inspiration. They've introduced them to music that they may have never heard before. They've realised that they're... Some, somewhere in their heads that they could be sitting there in 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And also for the orchestra, they've played to an audience who was just so hungry to hear what they had to offer, fully appreciated what they had to offer. The people who participated with the Ulster Orchestra as visitors just felt really valued that someone with the prestige of the orchestra was sitting in their neighbourhood. And that's what the art should look like. Philia had started and it really was in response to what was you know anti-internment protests but to do it in a way that brought out the best of what we had to offer and for me Philia started with that started with doing something totally positive last week two weeks ago even the whole build up to it talked about the whole issue of conversation you know, West Belfast talks back is now something people want to attend to rather than trying to avoid uh, you have an engaged audience where people have come through a political conflict or come through the aftermath of the conflict who are still waiting on those conversations to be had with them being included but are open enough to hear other people's views. So it's a generosity of spirit. You have also people, Republicans from this area, writing and talking about the impact of First World War, the impact of suicide, the impact of sexual abuse, the impact of a lack of education around sexual health, sexual awareness. And the whole thing about citizenship, which was really at the root for me as a woman near 50, as a woman who was involved in struggle, who is now involved in political activism, I'm now Minister for Arts as a result of all that. I'm enriched because of all that, but the whole art of conversation is really about making sure that people are included. Thalia have not only latched onto that, but have nurtured and encouraged it. We've had a carnival of art. We've had film, we've had dance, we've had music, we've had concerts, we've had conversations, we've had craft, carnivals on the streets, puppeteering, we've had the heap. And I think without the West Belfast Failure, who also work with Shankill, so it's all happening at the same time, work with the art, art 
people in North Belfast also work with East Side Arts. So it's almost like, and the, the Belfast Film Festival, it's like a collaboration of cultural partnerships, work with Melia too. And I think this city and this part of the city has been, but the whole city has been particularly enriched as a result of what Phil have had to offer. Because West Belfast in the media was portrayed as a no-go area. And now it's portrayed as a must-see part of the, the city, but a, a must-take-in part of cultural programmes. And, and I'm just delighted to be part of that. I also see it as, still, I still see it as an act of subs subversion where people from our community come out and talk about how they're affected, how they feel, express in whatever way they feel, even if I don't agree with the way in which politically the message is, so what? It's because we came from a background where we were censored, tried to be subdued, um, and this is for me, it's about, it's about liberation, it's about liberation of emotions, it's about liberations of expression, but it's also about making sure that there's a legacy there where we'll never have to look over our shoulder again that will always make sure that what we have, it's a bit like the stuff in the jails. I always use this as an example. Get what you can for people now, but always look over your shoulder for people coming behind you, because there's always going to be people coming behind you. And make sure that you make it stronger for those coming behind, so you don't have to go through what we went through. And arts do that brilliantly, and they've done it brilliantly as part of failure. I've grown up with Fela in football I, I, from the inception of Fela and I'm, I'm heavily involved with the visual arts throughout Fela and, and have been um, with events over the years and I am so proud that this is the first, one of the first events, the, an event on the first night of Fela. I'm one of the artists here um, in the show, uh, we're opening our show, our three person exhibition tonight in Shanahas based on the theme of poetry and place. The three artists, what was interesting was we interpreted it from our own perspectives. Um, some of the artists use landscape or look to landscape, whereas um, my work has been dealing with childhood memories. I started to think about the theme, started exploring the theme of poetry of place. I looked back to childhood and thought, well, what was my landscape? So I looked at different things, different elements of, of what I had seen about the place. and. What stuck in my mind was that we used to see just barbed wire everywhere and a lot of what I was doing or a lot of what you will see in this show is dresses, small dresses and um, then it developed into, well, what would the, where would the dresses be, what context would, we, would they be in, had them hanging on lines, hanging on washing lines, so, but one of the pieces I decided, well, let's hang it on, on barbed wire and, and play with that, play around with the associations. One of the things um, from childhood that I remember, it's a very strong memory for me in relation to hopes and aspirations, was this little piece of wedding paper that I had when I was about three and I drew on the back of it and I just remember how I felt at the time and I always remember that and I, I searched and searched for this piece of wedding paper, searched on, online and I found it and I've just been using it in my work to symbolise to, to portray feelings and, and to symbolise hopes and aspirations and, and that time and playing about with it and developing it and just really, really pushing the boundaries with it. And I'm involved with the Public Art in the Community programme with the Upper Springfield Development Trust and that's a participative approach to arts. That's engaging people in um, addressing issues through arts, addressing some very hard-hitting issues through the arts. Um, and it we find that it provides a platform to explore those issues that otherwise people wouldn't even touch upon. This year in Fela, I have been coordinating the visual arts exhibitions in, mainly in St Mary's, St Mary's University College on the Falls Road. And we put a call out to the, all the arts e-bulletins throughout Ireland and we've had a brilliant response, just a brilliant response. The artists, what I've seen is that the artists are so excited to be part of this Fela. They are coming from all over the country and it's just, it's, it just brings a smile to your face.
Of course, art goes right across the board when you think about it. Uh, and I don't know how to define it. It's, it's like the question, you know, uh, the meaning of life, I think. But I suppose what I could say about it is, is that it, 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 it is, to me, sort of a reflection of life, but in all its aspects. In other words, it can be a moment you've caught, which meant something to you that moment, but 10 minutes later didn't have the same importance. Or it could be, you know, a philosophical moment or a, a moment of great import, which you have been able to reflect. I mean, I like poetry and... I wrote poetry as a bit of therapy in jail. I wanted to set things down, and I like poetry because it, it, it took the essence of what you're saying and put it in a, in a, in a fairly concise and hopefully uh, um, accurate way. But I didn't think of any of that when I was doing it. I just did it uh, because it was something that appealed to me. I always liked poetry. I read poetry. And I still do it, and the reason I like it is because especially, not necessarily in busy lives, but there's some people who actually enjoy reading, some people who don't. But you can take a poetry book down and you can read it for five seconds, five minutes or five hours. And I've always got something out of it. Um, and I'm no uh, poetry critic, but um, except in this, there's things I like and things I don't like. And I, and, and I think that's what's good about art. One of the poems that, that, that I wrote, and, um, and which was a, a, in a certain way an interesting journey, was uh, started off on the night of Bobby Sands' death. And uh, we, we were, I was in jail, the hut was full, so there were nizzing huts, like a uh, prisoner of war camp huts. So there was about 30-odd um, prisoners there. The television was in the middle corridor. Uh, the lights were off. Everybody was expecting news, and I think it was the 9 o'clock news, and we went up and stood there. And I remember, I actually remember the silence. There was a certain number of chairs, but I was standing at the back. His mother came out and announced it, and she actually came out in a van. I think his father was also in the van, but she was the only one who came out. Obviously devastated, and she only said one sentence, and it was, my son is dying. And I went down into my, my cell or cubicle and um, I started writing because my mind was racing. The other thing was there was complete silence. When the, when the news item was over, everybody just left. They didn't speak to each other. And they all went down into their individual cells or cubicles. And uh, you could hear a pin drop. And it, it had been my habit to write. So I, I just had all these things in through my head. And it was about comradeship and about Bobby Sands, about his sacrifice, about the Republican struggle about uh, prisoners, about um, hunger strike, about all of it. And I'd been on hunger strike myself when I was a bit younger. And I wrote, I'd say, nearly 20 verses. And I, I set it aside. You know, it was very rough and ratty. And uh, I came back to it. I couldn't really come back to it for about, I'd say, about six months. And it was playing in my head. This didn't always happen at this stage, you know. And it was the frustration and it was the, the comradeship and, and all of that and the sacrifice, you know. And when I come back to look at it in my notes, I actually realised that what had affected me and what I actually wanted to write about was not Bobby Sands. It was his mother. And, the, and, and it changed from a poem of some 20 verses down to four verses um, about Bobby's mother and about that moment. Rosalind Sands, you do not know me. I saw you only on a television screen when so reluctantly you announced my son is dying. Standing with such dignity and calm in your suppressed and deeply personal grief. I felt an intruder to your private torment, witness to a mother's naked mourning. Thank you for allowing us to share your precious final moments with a great man. And uh, my mother had died uh, when I, she was quite young, like she was only 47, and I was in between jails. Um, so I was about 19 or something. And I found myself getting quite emotional. I, I, I don't think it was that emotional when I was writing it, but, uh, and, and it was about grief. But it was 14 years after she had died. I would like to pen a sculpted monument to you. Intricate carvings of filial love, words of artistic nuance, esoteric subtleties to catch the discerning eye or ear. 
but I have no such intimacy of you or talent for such craft. You're in my thoughts with primroses, coffee made in hot milk and soft white mints. You were never big on luxuries. Death stole you young before we could be friends and that immeasurable loss is perhaps the essence of my grief. An emptiness of unknown dimension which cannot be filled even by the magnitude of respect I feel for you. I remember your drenching spontaneity of tears when your own mother died, whereas I suspect I wept more dutifully. Though I remain uncertain, grief can seep insidiously deep. It is, after all, 14 years since you died. I remember my brother when, when I decided to get it published, because it was still in jail, it was published outside. You know, he's saying, uh, like, uh, the screws read this, you know, they know what you're thinking and all of that. And, and I had thought about it in the meantime, you know, before I'd actually committed to publishing. And what I realised, uh, and again, this is a wee bit of a personal revelation, is that when you write very personal stuff down in that sense, especially as a prisoner and as a, a, an activist, you actually, it, it, it is no longer a weakness. Sometimes it's a weakness if it's a secret because you don't want, you don't want to show emotion in front of guards. You don't want to show any what was called weakness in, in front of guards and all of that. And, and of course, in jail, you have emotional periods. You know, I mean, I was, I suppose, I, I was force-fed over a long period of time. And, it's, and it is a very emotional and quite brutal process. And I was very young at the time. Uh, and at times then, I would have broke down. Uh, and, and you think of that at the time as weakness, but when, when I ended up writing about that and other things, I, I realised that by putting it out there, and I said this to Mughal I said, by putting it out there, it, it becomes a strength. They can't use it against me anymore because I'm the one who put it out there. That I realised that in writing it down, it became a strength. It doesn't mean to say everything you write down is a strength, but I'm talking specifically in, in what most people would see as you showing your soul or showing your heart or showing your emotion that that could be used against you. I actually found it strengthened me. So art is very much about getting up in the morning, about breathing, about your nourishment, about your health. It's also about your well-being, your whole psyche and everything else around you. A lot of the work that's been commissioned in Northern Ireland has been about that. It's been about trying to bring people together to acknowledge communities and to allow communities to, to move forward. And I, I think the arts has a huge role to play there. It, that's where it is. Uh, that's where it's most effective. To create dramas that present unheard stories, that present stories that we haven't heard before, we haven't engaged with before, and through that help people reassess their perception of other. It's the processes within, the, within our practice that become important, so if, you know we're less interested in a, a sculpture or a particular object and more interested in social relations. Ultimately it is enriching because it contributes to what it is to the meaning of being a human being. I don't think uh, society should or could go through life, no matter how bad it is, without uh, art being a part of it. The art project was funded through the Louth Peace and Reconciliation Partnership under the Peace Tree Programme. Uh, it was really, a, it allowed the LMATB to invite proposals from artists to work with particularly target groups of the Peace Tree Programme. And so the aim was to use the arts as a means of peace building, to reduce sectarianism, to reduce racism within the county. I think the arts provide a very unique way of looking at all these events outside the ordinary. 
if you look at the way that peace building has been approached in terms of workshops all the artists that we have engaged with have really developed very innovative you know ways of engaging with quite contentious issues uh, they raise things which wouldn't normally be raised uh, they can approach things where you think it's a, quite a safe thing but it's actually you know can be quite contentious at the same time um, so that that's the job of the artist to really to really pull it out of the ordinary you know